So the the right. So welcome back. After we all ate too much yesterday evening, let's let's try to to do some light physics this morning. <laughs> so the, my my plan for today was that we uh, first. Uh, go back to the topic of neutrino mass measurements and talk a little more about the experimental aspect of that topic. And then in the second part of today's lecture, I would like to talk about the neutrino oscillation anomalies. Uh, and we'll see how far we get with that. Okay. <clears throat> so neutrino mass measurements, if you remember, we discussed two uh, ways of, of measuring neutrino masses. And uh, one of them was the kinematic method, and the other one was neutrinoless double beta decay. And about the kinematic method, I know that there are some in the audience who know much more about this than I do. Um, so the, the state of the art in kinematic neutrino mass measurements is the Katrin experiment in Karlsruhe, where the, the basic idea is you have a tritium source, so decaying tritium atoms. Um, then the electrons from those decays are passed through, well, in fact, through two spectrometers um, and are eventually uh, detected. And these spectrometers are designed in such a way that the spectrometer is typically operated in a mode such that only the very most energetic electrons, so the ones very, very close to the endpoint of the beta spectrum, are able to reach the detector. And then you can vary that threshold, so you can vary the threshold above which electrons are able to pass the detector. And that way you can map out the endpoint region of the spectrum. And in particular, you, you can then determine if the endpoint is exactly where it is supposed to be, or if it's a little bit below um, the Q value of the decay, which would indicate the ex existence of neutrino masses. Now, why is that so complicated? So first of all, this thing is really, really big, <clears throat> um, but that's not the only thing. I mean, it, all of this, the, the electric and magnetic fields in here need to be understood extremely precisely because remember we are trying to measure a 0.1 electron volt neutrino mass um, with electrons that have an energy of almost 20 keV. So we need a relative precision uh, on their energy of better than 10 to the minus, uh, of, of, well, let's say of order 10 to the minus five. And that's, that's really quite a, a, a tremendous challenge. One important aspect uh, already at the start of the experiment is the source here. So you need tritium and you need a large amount of it because only very, very few decays will happen close to the endpoints. So you need to compensate for that by just having a very, very large amount of tritium here. Now, the problem is you can't just keep that tritium in a container <clears throat> because the electrons would need to get out of the container and they would interact with the container walls and this would distort their energy. So what Katrin is using is what's called a windowless gaseous tritium source, which is essentially um, an array of ingeniously designed pumps that are able to confine a large amount of tritium in a, um, in a chamber that is open on both sides. But the, the pumping is done in such a way that even though it's open on, on or, or at least it's, it's open on, on the front end, um, even though it's open, uh, basically no tritium gets out that way. Only the decay electrons get out. So to give you an, um, an, an, an idea for how big the spectrometer really is, uh, this is what, it, uh, what, what the spectrometer vessel looked like uh, during transportation. Tra transportation of Katrin was actually quite funny um, <laughs> because so Katrin is here um, and the spectrometer vessel was built here. So Western Germany versus uh, Southwest Germany versus Southeast Germany. Um, but the problem is it's too big to fit under a highway bridge. So how do you get it from here to there? The original idea, as far as I know, was um, to have a, a Zeppelin, so a blip, uh, transported. But, but the company operating those blips went bankrupt, so that, that, that fell through. <laughs> um, and so instead, it had to take the long route down the Danube River into the Black Sea, through the Mediterranean, up the Atlantic coast, and back up the Rhine River. Um, and then only the, the, last, the, the last few kilometers or so had to be done on road. And this is what this looked like. And he, here, you, here you can also see why you can't scale this anymore because then the spectrometer would no longer fit between those two houses here. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was quite an, so this is like, this is like a, a very small town on the Rhine River close to Karlsruhe. And this must have been quite an event for the local population. <laughs> Now this is this is what it 
what it now looks like uh, in the experimental hall uh, where it stands. This is a view of the inside. <clears throat> what you can't see really well on this picture is um, the thousands of wires that form like the, the field cage that shapes the, uh, the uh, uh, electric field here. Okay, oops. Wait, why do we have, oh, why do we have that twice? Okay, so this is uh, what uh, Katrin data looks like. This is as of 2021. Um, that's what the endpoint region of the beta spectrum looks like. Um, <clears throat> and what you're basically looking for is you're, you're, you're trying to determine as precisely as possible this point here and to see if it's a little bit shifted to the left compared to uh, where it's supposed to be for massless neutrinos. And so the, the limit as of 2021 was mu less than 0.8 uh, electron volt. So this is of course still uh, uh, larger than what we expect neutrino mass to be if uh, they were truly hierarchical. So if the, the, the lightest neutrino mass is very, very close to zero, but it's already sub EV sensitivity and that's already quite impressive. Now, the other technique for measuring neutrino masses uh, that I mentioned very, very briefly is uh, the technique used by the so-called project eight experiment. And the idea is the following. You have here, you have like a, a volume again of tritium gas. And when one of those atoms decays, the electron uh, is guided along magnetic field lines. So it spirals around magnetic field lines. And as it does so, it emits synchrotron radiation. And then uh, this synchrotron radiation is uh, being detected. <clears throat> and from measuring the frequency of that synchrotron radiation, you try to infer the, elect the energy of the electron and thereby map out the spectrum. Now, the problem is of course, the region of the spectrum you're most interested in is the endpoint region, but only very few decays go into the endpoint region. So you have a huge, let's call it background of electrons with lower energies and you need to separate all those signals. So that's the, a, a really challenging data acquisition and data analysis problem. Here is what this looks like. Uh, for a single electron, the horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is the frequency of the synchrotron radiation, which is a direct measure for the electron energy. <clears throat> and what you basically see is um, the, the uh, onset of a signal here at, at whatever time that is. And then the uh, electron slowly loses energy. Um, at some point, it does a hard scattering, loses an, a large amount of energy in one go, and so on. And now imagine that this is, that this is not happening once, but this is happening uh, uh, many, many, many times simultaneously. And the challenge is then to, to uh, identify single electrons in, 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 in basically thousands of such plots or superimposed onto each other. Okay, let's talk about neutrinos double beta decay next. Here is again a, a prettier version of the diagram that I drew in the lecture. Um, standard double beta decay is on the left. You have two neutrons converting to two protons simultaneously, but in a sense independently. And for neutrinos double beta decay, the two neutrino lines are connected. So the only thing that comes out are the two electrons. <clears throat> Here is uh, one experiment of many looking for neutrino double beta decay. That's a sketch of the Gerda experiment in the Gran Sasso lab. So the actual detectors are these, these little things here uh, at the center. These are ultra pure germanium detectors that are enriched in an isotope uh, that undergoes double beta decay, namely germanium 76. So uh, the detector is in a sense, the, these germanium crystals, they are simultaneously the source and the detector. So they are, germanium is a semiconductor. So it's an honest to God semiconductor detector, but because there is this double beta decaying isotope in it, um, it's also the source for what it observes. And then it has uh, uh, onion shells of shielding around it as is customary for all these low background experiments. 
for instance, in the case of Gerda, there is a large vessel filled with liquid argon to shield it. But of course, that comes with extra challenges because the, this means that now these detectors are operating inside liquid argon and you need electronics that operates inside liquid argon. The liquid argon again is surrounded uh, by a water shielding that is used as for shielding and vetoing as well. <clears throat> That's where it's roughly located. That's the uh, Gran Sasso Mountains in central Italy, um, maybe 100 kilometers east of, east of Rome. There's a highway tunnel leading through those mountains. And when they built the highway tunnel, they had the foresight to say, well, now that we have the tunnel boring machine down there anyway, let's, let's, let's dig a little further. And so they built uh, the largest underground lab in the world, uh, right under the uh, 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 central Apennine Massive. So there is a, a large amount of overburden. It's not, it's not the deepest lab in the world, but it has a fairly decent amount of overburden. But it, it's especially uh, uh, important because it's easily accessible because there's a highway tunnel, so you can drive in with a truck, so you don't have to to bring down all your material through a narrow mine shaft or so, but you can really drive in with a, with a 40 ton truck. And the experimental halls are really, really big. So there's really huge experiments that are housed down there. I'm not sure if Katrin would fit in. <laughs> it wouldn't fit through the front door, it, but the halls might actually be big enough. So this is what uh, Gerda data looks like. The horizontal axis here is energy. The vertical axis is event rate. Um, and the upper panel here is just a zoom into the lower one. So what you have here at low energies is uh, the spectrum from two neutrino double beta decay. Now that alone is already a very rare process. It has a half-life of, of 10 to the 21 years, but you can see how many events they nevertheless observe of this process. But to them, that's primarily a background. Then you see all kinds of peaks here from various radioactive contaminations that you can never avoid. Of course, you try to build your detector as clean as possible. So every screw, every valve, everything that goes into this detector is very, very carefully monitored and selected for low radioactivity before it goes in. But nevertheless, you can never fully get rid of, of ambient radioactivity. Um, and so, so you, see, you see that there's a few peaks left even after the analysis cuts. So before the analysis cuts, you have much more peaks here, but much of that can be rejected. Um, now, the critical region in which you're looking is here around this point labeled Q beta beta. This is the Q value for, neutrinos, uh, for, for the double beta decay. And so if the decay is neutrinoless, then all the decay energy goes to the two electrons. So you'd expect a peak at precisely this energy. In two neutrino double beta decay, there's always some energy taken away by the neutrinos, which you do not see. So two neutrino double beta decay is always below this point and neutrinos double beta decay would correspond to a peak right at this point. So up here, you see the data zoomed into that region. Uh, you see that there is only very, very, very few background events surviving here. And that for the moment, there is no evidence uh, of, any, of, of any cut here, of, of, any, uh, of any peak. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. What is expecting half life for the neutrino less double beta decay? And that depends on the neutrino mass, so we don't know. Okay. It could be zero. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the decay rate could be zero, so the half life could be infinite. Um, or it could be, uh, I, I don't know exactly what the current limit is in, in terms of half life. Maybe I have that on the next slide. Yeah, here, here I have it on, on, on the slide. Um, so this is uh, Gerda sensitivity, uh, and here's the, the, the actual Gerda limit then. So you see that's 10 to the 26 years, but as I said, it could in principle uh, be infinite. So this plot illustrates two things. So what's shown here is on the horizontal axis, the half-life for, for neutrino double beta decay of germanium 76, and on the horizontal axis, the half-life of another double beta decaying isotope, xenon-136, which is also popular with, with experiments. So for uh, germanium-76 up here is the, the GADA limit, and for xenon-136, uh, there's various limits shown here. Um, so the problem is if you want to translate these limits into knowledge on neutrino masses, then the problem is that 
the rate for neutrinos double beta decay, it is proportional to uh, some effective neutrino mass, but it is also proportional to nuclear matrix elements. And those nuclear matrix elements um, introduce a large uncertainty. And that is shown via these diagonal lines here. So for different uh, calculations of the nuclear matrix elements, uh, these curves show um, uh, the relation between the half-lives of those two different isotopes. The little ticks here on the curves correspond to neutrino masses. So you see that, for instance, if you believe this yellow curve here, then GADA would have a sensitivity below 0.2 electron volts already, and uh, the xenon experiments would be even better. On the other hand, if you believe the, the blue curve here, then the sensitivity uh, of the xenon based experiments would be much worse and the bonding giada would be roughly similar. So there is this large uncertainty in nuclear matrix elements. And the problem is that these nuclear matrix elements, uh, they cannot be measured other than by measuring neutrinos double beta decay. So they really have to come from theory. And these are large nuclei. Remember these, these are 76 nucleons or 136 nucleons. Um, so that's a highly non-trivial multi-body problem. And yeah, various approximations exist to calculate this, but you see how large the spread in their predictions is. So one reason it cannot be uh, directly measured is now you might think, well, isn't two neutrino double beta decay almost the same as neutrino double beta decay? So shouldn't the matrix elements be related? And the problem is they are not because in neutrino double beta decay, since the neutrino lines here are connected, this decay favors uh, two very nearby nucleons decaying simultaneously. Whereas in two neutrino double beta decay, it doesn't matter. The two decaying nucleons could be at opposite sides, on opposite sides of the nucleus. And that's why those matrix elements are typically quite different. So this one here uh, depends on, on short range interactions between the two decaying nucleons. Whereas this one here also feels uh, longer distance effects. And that's one, one of the reasons why this is why, why it's impossible to directly measure this. Me. Yes. Uh, in the previous plot, I think the one with the signals. Yeah, yeah. that one. I'm curious about uh, because you have these lines of prior to analysis cut and then uh, the red ones with after analysis yeah. cuts. I guess that the, the prior there is the signals that you are then rejecting, or was no the... prior to, prior to analysis cuts just means before analysis cuts. I think this is mainly the veto that does it doing its job here. Yeah, I'm from Garda collaboration. Sorry. Then I should step aside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the one white is just what we see without uh, any analysis. Then we just cut apply the cuts that are related to the signal. So uh, trying to discriminate the signal from all the background. Um, so we have different signals inside the detectors, different kinds of signals. The, it depends on uh, how many uh, energy deposition we have in the signal. And for the uh, neutrino less double of the decay, decay, we just expect to have one deposition in one detector. So if we have different coincidence, we just can cut this kind of events. and applying all the cuts, we just have the uh, survival events that are in red. Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Um, any more questions on neutrino masses? Um, maybe that's again something that you can answer much better. <laughs> what are the gray lines in that top plot? The, the vertical ones. Uh, they are related to some gamma peaks that we know that they are related to the, the background. So they are just to, to highlight that there we expect to have gamma peaks. We expect it annually. Yes. What's your background rate? What's your, sorry? What's your background rate? What's your signal rate? Um, we have like, um, I can check it because I don't have, yeah, I have here. The background index is like 
uh, 5.210 to minus four counts uh, normalized to the exposure of the, the, the experiment. So you're accounting with gamma ray alpha to the metal bond, Sorry? You're accounting with the, the gamma ray to metal bond. Uh, or is that is that uh, 10 to the minus 5 that the background rate before cuts or after cuts so the, the red ones or the or the white okay uh, it's alphas yeah in that region the domination is given by alphas <clears throat> Okay, then uh, let's uh, switch gears and let's switch uh, presentations to uh, oscillation anomalies. So I thought about whether I should talk about uh, long baseline oscillation experiments or about short baseline anomalies, but I feel that somehow you hear about the long baseline experiments so frequently. Um, and the physics in that the short baseline experiments as looking for is, is, is not too dissimilar. And therefore, I, uh, therefore I, I thought I'd rather talk about oscillation anomalies because when something's anomalous, it's always more fun. Okay. So the uh, reason we are talking about oscillation anomalies is <clears throat> because they are a way of probing what's called the neutrino portal. So the neutrino portal is a Lagrangian operator of this form. This is essentially just a Yukawa coupling. We've seen this coupling when we talked about Dirac neutrino masses. So here's a lepton doublet, here is the Higgs field, and here is a right-handed neutrino, a sterile neutrino, a heavy neutral lepton, or whatever you want to call it. It's a singlet fermion. Um, this I sigma two times H star, uh, that just, is an operator that flips the upper and lower components of the Higgs field by keeping it and by maintaining the right SU2 transformation pro properties. Um, you remember from the standard model Lagrangian, you do that in order to give masses to the uptype quarks and the neutrinos, whereas for the downtype quarks and the, and the charged leptons, you just put the plain Higgs field in here because in the usual convention, the Higgs acquires the VEF in the lower component. So in order to give mass to an uptype quark or a neutrino, you need to move that to the upper component. And that's what the I sigma two is doing. But so this operator here, um, it is special because it is the only renormalizable coupling of the standard model to a singlet fermion. So if there is any kind of dark sector in nature, so a, stand, a, a sector of standard model singlet particles, and if among those particles, there is a fermion, then that's the only renormalizable coupling it can have to standard model particles. Um, and because it's, it's renormalizable, it's typically the least suppressed one. And what it does is, well, as you know, it makes a contribution to the neutrino mass matrix. So it effectively leads to mixing between neutrinos and these singlet fermions. <clears throat> okay. So there is some confusion about what we call this singlet fermion. So let me briefly try to clarify this. Um, this singlet fermion, I call it a sterile neutrino. Other people call it a heavy neutral lepton, yet others call it a right-handed neutrino, but it's always the same thing. It basically depends on, on which community it is and what people are using it for. And it has in fact many uses. So this operator has been considered for, for lots of purposes. For instance, as we've already seen, you need such singlet neutrinos if you want to explain neutrino masses via the seesaw mechanism. In that case, the mass of the singlet neutrinos can be anywhere between the TV scale up to the Planck scale, basically. Um, it can explain the cosmic baryon asymmetry through the uh, so-called leptogenesis mechanism, which basically is a mechanism where the decays of these heavy right-handed neutrinos are CP violating. And as they decay in the very early universe, they create an asymmetry between particles and antiparticles that then survives until today. So it's one of the probably most elegant mechanisms to explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Singlet, uh, singlet fermions, so sterile neutrinos, have been invoked as a dark matter candidate. 
that possibility is, is I think is still open, but it's getting more and more constrained. Um, well, they can act as mediators to dark matter. So they can, if they are not the dark matter themselves, they might be the way through which dark matter couples to the standard model. And finally, they explain the oscillation anomalies. And here I have something left over from a previous time when I showed this slide. Um, <clears throat> right, so if these singlet fermions exist, there's two things that can happen. Uh, if this is a rather light particle, then it will participate in neutrino oscillations. And if it's heavier, then, uh, well, it won't oscillate because then whenever it is produced, we can kinematically determine whether we have produced a light or a heavy neutrino, so there won't be oscillations. But then it can still be produced in neutrino interactions and its decays can then be observed. And we are here going to focus on the first possibility. Um, Okay, we've already seen how to derive neutrino oscillation probabilities. I'm just showing this here again to remind you that this formula, the general formula for the neutrino oscillation probability uh, did not in any way depend on the fact that there is three neutrino flavors. So the whole derivation works in exactly the same way if there is more than three neutrino flavors. Um, just the mixing matrix is then a four by four matrix or a five by five or six by six matrix rather than a three by three matrix. But other than that, neutrino oscillations would work in exactly the same way. Okay, now uh, let's talk about one first consequence of such an operator. And that is, uh, uh, imagine for the moment that you have such a sterile neutrino and it mixes, for instance, with muon neutrinos, then muon neutrinos can disappear into sterile neutrinos through oscillations. So you produce a certain flux of muon neutrinos. Ideally, you, you have some knowledge of how many muon neutrinos you have produced. And then after some distance, you measure that flux. And if you're lucky, you see some muon neutrinos missing. So you see a uh, uh, disappearance of muon neutrinos. So here is, is, is one way of doing such an experiment. Uh, it's a typical, the typical sketch of an accelerator-based neutrino experiment. You have a high intensity, high energy proton beam hitting a target, that target that's typically a, a, a elongated rod of some solid material. Um, <clears throat> and so what happens is uh, the protons hit that target and as they do so, they produce lots of nuclear debris and most prominent among this nuclear debris is light mesons, so especially pions. So basically you create a huge flux of pions. Then there is a magnetic focusing system. These are called magnetic horns, whose purpose is to focus those pions more or less in the forward direction in order to produce a nice forward beam. Then the pions are allowed to decay, which produces neutrinos. And then afterwards, there is some absorber. Typically there's just a few hundred meters of rock uh, that will absorb anything but the neutrinos. And yeah, then after that, somewhere you detect your neutrinos. So here's a result from such muon disappearance experiments. Um, what is shown here on the horizontal axis is the mixing matrix element U mu four square. So that's the mixing between the hypothetical sterile neutrino and a muon neutrino. The vertical axis, uh, delta M for one square, that's the mass squared difference between the sterile neutrino and the active neutrinos. Um, you see the scale that I've chosen here is uh, a one electron volt sterile neutrino would be here in the middle of this plot. And as you can see, if you look at the, there's different kinds of experiments that have looked for muon neutrino disappearance and their combined limit is somewhere at the 10 to the minus two level. What is not shown in this plot yet is that uh, one of the latest ice cube papers on the subject has a closed region at 90% confidence level here. Okay, so the different experiments here are in particular different types of accelerator-based experiments and then atmospheric neutrino experiments. This is deep core ice cube and super Kamiokande combined here. Okay, now let me quickly see if I should skip a slide or two here. No, let's, let's, con let's continue right where we are. Um, so the reason I'm introducing this, the reason I'm talking about sterile neutrinos here is because some experiments have observed results that would be consistent 
with oscillations involving sterile neutrinos. I'm not saying that they have discovered sterile neutrinos because as you'll see later, uh, this explanation comes with severe problems. Um, but some experiments have observed anomalous results that people have interpreted as oscillations involving a false neutrino flavor. Let's put it that way. Um, and I want to give you a run through these anomalies and, and what their current status is. Now let's start with this one. Um, this is a plot showing the measured neutrino flux from nuclear reactors. The horizontal axis shows the distance of the neutrino source from the detector and the vertical axis shows the observed event rate divided by the predicted event rate. So in an, in an ideal world, you'd, you'd expect these data points to cluster here around one, around the dashed line at one. But what you can see here in this plot, which is uh, like the status as of early 2021, um, the data that has been, this, so these are all experiments that have run over the past few decades, so the data clusters around an average that is significantly below one. So it would seem like the experiments have all observed uh, a deviation from one and therefore would have seen evidence for disappearance of electron neutrinos into whatever, maybe a sterile neutrino. Okay. <clears throat> now, what has happened, however, is the theoretical prediction has changed recently, and now it's all beautifully consistent again. So that anomaly, if you've heard about it, in my opinion, that anomaly is gone since about a year ago or so. And the funny thing about this was, um, so the anomaly arose in 2011, not because there was new data. So in fact, most of this data here had already been taken prior to 2011. But what happened in 2011 was there were two new calculations of the reactor neutrino flux. The previous calculation was from sometime in the 1980s. And basically by pure coincidence, it was consistent with the data. But in 2011, people realized that the old calculation had its problems and they did better. And with the better calculation, they found this discrepancy. Now you have to understand that these calculations, they are very complicated. What you do is, um, so in a nuclear reactor, you have basically four fissile isotopes, uranium-235, uranium-238, plutonium-239, and plutonium-241. If you bombard any of these with neutrons, um, they produce a, a large spectrum of daughter nuclei, most of which are neutron rich and therefore unstable. And so they undergo chains of beta decays until they end up with the stable or long lived final state. And in total, there's about 6,000 different beta decays contributing to the neutrino spectrum in a nuclear reactor. Most of these beta decays are from extremely short lived isotopes. So they are essentially impossible to directly study in the laboratory. So you can't just look them up in some nuclear data table and, and learn about their properties. They just have never been measured in a laboratory. So while you can infer part of the reactor neutrino spectrum based on the information in nuclear data tables, there's about 10% of the spectrum so that you cannot explain that way because it comes from decays that have never been studied in, a, in, in the lab and that never uh, uh, got, got valid entries in the nuclear data tables. So what you do instead is um, you exploit the fact that in a beta decay, all the energy that does not go to the electron has to go to the neutrino. <coughs> Nuclear recoil is negligible. So you take a, a, uh, like a thin foil of uranium-235, for instance, you irradiate it with neutrons, and you watch the electrons that come out, and you measure their spectrum. Now, if that was a single beta decay, it would be easy. You would take the electron spectrum, you would know the Q value of that reaction, and you would immediately say, okay, any energy that doesn't go to the electron goes to the neutrino, so I have the neutrino spectrum. The problem is because there's thousands of decays, you can't do that. So you need to do a fit. You need to, uh, you need to deconstruct your measured electron spectrum into individual electron spectra from individual decays. And you have to do that by fitting because you don't know the exact uh, ratios of, of the different isotopes. Um, and then based on that fit, you have a hypothesis for how much each of these beta decays contributes. And then for each of them, you do the inversion of the spectrum. So you, you attribute all the energy that's not going to the electron to the neutrino. So that's a non-trivial process that comes with large systematic uncertainties. But now in retrospect, it turns out 
the theorists who did this calculation, they did have the systematic uncertainties under control, but the problem is the input data. So the input data are those beta spectrum from irradiating uranium-235 or uranium-238 foils. Those measurements were from the 1980s. And what happened uh, last year was that one of these spectra, in particular the one from uranium-235, has been remeasured. And it is this remeasurement of the input data to the theoretical calculation that led to this shift and that removed the anomaly. Okay, so that's one anomaly behind which we can put a check mark. So sometimes anomalies actually do get resolved. Um, now, but now let's talk about other anomalies that are not that were not as fortunate. Um, and let me know, let me skip the gallium anomaly for the moment. Um, and let me move right to the anomalies from accelerator based experiments because they are there we, from those I think we can learn more at the moment. So that's uh, what you see here is an exper. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I'm just wondering, maybe it's because I have my head under a rock, but why, why was this shift in the, the reactor anomaly? If, if it really gets rid of the reactor anomaly, why was this not bigger news? Maybe not too many people cared about the reactor anomaly anymore. <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, the, the reactor anomaly was always floating somewhere around the three sigma level. And already in the past few years, people had cast doubt on it from different directions. So there were some doubts about the estimation of some of the systematic uncertainties. Now, as I said, in retrospect, I think that estimation was probably okay. Um, but I guess a large fraction of the community always had the impression since about a few years ago that there's probably something wrong with that calculation. So I, I, I see that, that several people, I think, are putting on their sweater. So should we maybe turn off the fan? <laughs> so maybe one slide back, you were talking about the re reactor neutrino fluxes and uh, about 6,000 beta decays in yeah. total. So I was wondering about the fit that you said that we need to deconstruct the fit. Uh, so I was wondering if the decay is continuous and if it is a very uh, continuous process, then there should be some kind of beta decays, which would be ha having the same threshold and that could actually mimic one of like uh, many events could be mimicked. Mm -hmm. So how are like... Uh, <laughs> so the way, the way these fits are done is you don't actually fit thousands of beta decays. That would be way too many parameters to, to do a decent fit. So you try to describe your spectrum by so-called effective beta decay. So you, you introduce a beta spectrum that you parameterize in terms of the Q value, the normalization, uh, and, and the effective nuclear charge, because that also appears in, that also has an effect on the, on the shape of the beta spectrum. And then uh, you fit one such beta spectrum such that, it take that, such that it accounts for as much of your spectrum as possible. Then you subtract this, and then you repeat that process maybe 10 or 20 times or so. Um, so it's not real beta decays that you're fitting, but you're, you're kind of, you're trying to describe the observed beta spectrum as a superposition of maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 20 individual beta spectra. Um, so, the, the, the people who invented this method, they have shown that it actually works. And the way you show this is, well, you artificially generate a beta spectrum based on the case that you know uh, from the nuclear data tables. You apply that procedure and you check that the neutrino spectrum you extract is identical to the neutrino spectrum you know from your Monte Carlo truth. So the method does actually work but it's not really a fit to real beta decays. So from the fit parameters, you don't learn anything about the beta decays that are actually contributing. Yeah, okay. uh, thank you. But yeah, so that's how, how this is done. Okay, then let's talk about um, anomalies from accelerator-based experiments, starting with uh, this one. This is the oldest one, that's the oldest anomaly. 
it actually predates the discovery of neutrino oscillations, I should say. So this is the LSND experiment, which uh, was running in the 1990s. And if you remember, neutrino oscillations were first discovered. Uh, well, what we now consider the discovery of neutrino oscillations was by Super Kamiokande, uh, no, by Kamiokande 2 in uh, 1998, I believe. But actually, LSND had an oscillation signal before that. So at the time, um, that could have been standard model oscillations, but now we know that they are not. So LSD stands for liquid scintillator neutrino detector. So it's not a very creative name, but okay. Um, the way it worked was um, there is a beam stop here. So from the left, there is protons coming in. And here there is a, a target station. In this case, the target is thick. So the pions that are produced in the target, they get stopped almost immediately. And then they decay at rest. And this decay at rest produces an isotropic flux of, of neutrinos. And at a distance of about 30 meters, there is a detector that is, as the name implies, a liquid scintillator neutrino detector. Um, and that detects those neutrinos. In particular, it's looking for electron antineutrino appearance in the muon antineutrino flux from pion decay at rest. The, the uh, reason they do it this way is because uh, electron antineutrinos have a very, very clean signature. They undergo inverse beta decay on a proton. So an electron antineutrino comes in, converts a proton into a neutron uh, plus a positron. So you get a prompt signal from the annihilation of that positron. And then that neutron, you now have a neutron bouncing around your detector. And after a certain time, that neutron uh, gets absorbed on another proton. And that emits a 2.2 uh, MeV gamma ray, which gives you a secondary signal. And this coincidence between the primary signal and the 2.2 MeV gamma ray from the neutron capture, that's a very, very clean signature. And therefore, this is really great for observing uh, electron antineutrinos. And moreover, it has a fairly large cross section for neutrino standards. Um, well, and finally, the advantage is that the pion decay is happening here. They do not produce electron antineutrinos. They produce electron neutrinos, but not electron antineutrinos. So that there is also no intrinsic background. Um, well, yes. And so the, the reason they did this is because they wanted to look for actual neutrino oscillations. And here is what they found. The horizontal axis in this plot is L over E. If you remember in the two flavor oscillation formula, the oscillation phase depended on L over E. That's why they plot their events in terms of this funny quantity. Um, and the vertical axis uh, is the number of events. The red and green histograms here are the expected backgrounds. And as you can see, the data is clearly above the background by about three sigma. The blue histogram is a two flavor oscillation fit. So they basically show they are that their signal can be explained in terms of oscillations. <clears throat> now, that anomaly is still with us. Uh, no one has come up with any good idea for what could explain it either within the standard model or beyond the standard model other than oscillations. Um, yeah, so it still stands. But of course, we know now because the distance between the source and detector and that experiment was only 30 meters, these can't be standard oscillations because over 30 meters standard oscillations at these energies here, order 50 MeV, standard oscillations would not have time to develop. So what you do when you have an anomaly that you can't resolve is you do another experiment to test the anomaly. And that experiment was supposed to be, um, well, Originally, it was supposed to be an experiment called Boon, which would have consisted of two detectors. Boon stands for booster neutrino experiment, but two detectors were too expensive. Uh, so it was downgraded to mini Boon, which is like uh, the uh, well, ha half of Boon, so only one detector. That turns out to have been a very, very bad decision, <clears throat> um, as we will see shortly. Um, but yeah, that, that's how it is. Also, it gives the wrong impression because while uh, over in Japan, we go from Kamiokande to Super Kamiokande to Hyper Kamiokande, a Fermilab is going from Boon to Mini Boon to Micro Boon. So <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that, that gives the totally wrong impression. The principle of, of, of Mini Boon is uh, similar to the sketch I showed before. You have a beam of protons that hits a target. There is a magnetically focusing horn around the target, which focuses the mesons in the forward direction. The mesons are allowed to decay 
um, then everything other than the neutrinos is absorbed. And here in this case, after a distance of uh, a little less than 500 meters, there is the detector. The detector is filled with uh, a mineral oil that on the one hand gives a scintillation signal, but the main signal for Mini Boon is actually Sharankov light. So the, the most of the information they get is from the Sharankov effect. And here's what Mini Boon found. So the horizontal axis is neutrino energy, the vertical axis is number of events. And that's again a search for electron neutrino appearance in a muon neutrino beam, but now at higher energies than in LSMB. The shaded histograms here are various backgrounds that we'll discuss in a moment. And as you can see, the data is quite significantly above the background. This is at the moment at a significance of 4.8 sigma. And what's even more funny is, if you try to explain this in terms of oscillations, it's actually consistent with LSNB. So that's shown over here. The horizontal axis is the effective two flavor mixing angle. And the vertical axis is again delta M square. The blue regions in the background is LSMB, the colored ones in the foreground is mini boom. So you see that they are actually consistent. But once again, this can't be standard oscillations because L over E is too small for that. So where does that leave us? Uh, we now have two unresolved anomalies that appear to be consistent with each other, but as we'll see, they are inconsistent with other experiments. Um, so before we entertain further the possibility that this is actually new physics, what they have seen, um, I want to explain to you a little bit uh, some of the backgrounds in Mini Boon because I find it I find that quite instructive to see where the challenges with such a measurement are and why predicting those backgrounds is difficult. So let's look at this light brown region here. It's the one that they label delta two n gamma. Um, so what that is is. Uh, it's a process where a neutrino interacts via the neutral current interaction and along the way excites a nucleon into the delta 1232 resonance. The delta 1232 is uh, the lowest lying excited state of the proton. And most of the time, this delta resonance decays back to a nucleon and a pion. That is a process that Mini Boon can see and identify. But there is a rare decay with a branching ratio of, of less than a percent that goes to a photon and a nucleon. And that is a process that Mini Boon cannot tell apart from its signal. So remember, this is a search for electron neutrinos. So an electron neutrino interacts via a charged current interaction. So there is a recoil nucleus and an electron coming out. The recoil nucleus is invisible because it's not fast enough to, pro to produce Sharankov light. So all you see is the electromagnetic shower produced by that electron. And to a detector like Mini Boon, one electromagnetic shower looks like the other. So an electromagnetic shower coming from a charged current nu -E interaction to them looks exactly the same as an electromagnetic shower coming from a single photon here. And that's why that's a dangerous background to them. Now, because it's so dangerous, of course, one invests a lot of effort to predict it. And in fact, one can use data-driven techniques to predict it. Namely, the delta production rate can be directly measured. As I mentioned before, there's this dominant decay mode to a pion and a nucleon that can be measured, that can be reconstructed. So one can directly measure how many of the delta resonances have been produced. So one might think, okay, well, then it's just a matter of multiplying by the appropriate branching ratio to get a rather robust prediction for that background. But it's not so easy. And the reason is that these delta resonances, they are not produced in free space, but they are produced inside an atomic nucleus. So before you can do this control measurement here, well, the pions need to get out of that nucleus. And then along the way, two things can happen. Either the pion excites another delta resonance. So now you have two delta resonances in an event rather than one. And so the chance that at least one of them decays radiatively is enhanced. You need to take that into account. Or the other possibility is the pion simply gets absorbed on its way out of the nucleus. So it never shows up in your control region. So the, your measurement of the control region is suppressed and you need to account for that as well. And Mini Boon are, are of course taking this into account, but this is one of the points where it's no longer a truly data-driven, no longer a purely data-driven uh, background prediction. This is where, where some theory needs to come in. And it's nuclear theory, so it's, it's, it's highly non-trivial. Okay, let me skip that slide. 
<clears throat> so let me, and I know that we are, we are approaching the end of the lecture, but let me spend these last minutes to tell you a little more about why this nuclear theory associated with neutrino interactions is so complicated. So here's a sketch of what happens when a neutrino interacts with a nucleus. Well, the neutrino exchanges a W boson with a nucleon. But the problem is that that nucleon does not exist in free space. It's inside an atomic nucleus. So already knowing its initial state uh, is almost impossible. You need to know the exact wave function of that nucleon inside the nucleus. You don't know that, so you need to, make, you need, you need to do some modeling. But it is, of course, important because if that nucleon is already coming into the interaction with a certain momentum, that, of course, has implications for what comes out of the interaction. Then, in addition to that, the nucleon is not alone. There is other nucleons, and the struck nucleon feels the presence of other nucleons. So basically, while the interaction is ongoing, uh, the nucleon that has been hit may exchange a pion with another nucleon. And that changes the, the, the kinematics of the interaction and also the energetics. And finally, even after the interaction is over, the interaction products need to make their way out of the nucleus so they can scatter multiple times and undergo so-called final state interactions that also need to be modeled somehow. <laughs> now, even this primary interaction here is already non-trivial. So what happens when a neutrino hits a nucleon depends very strongly on the energy at which it happens. At, well, at the very lowest energies, uh, the neutrino never sees the nucleon individually. That's the regime of coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering that I'm not going to go into here. But then at energies up to maybe order 100 MeV or a few hundred MeV, the dominant process is quasi-elastic scattering. That means the momentum transfer is low enough that the neutrino is not able to resolve the substructure of the nucleon. So it just sees the nucleon as if it were an elementary particle and just scatters on it. But, so that's a relatively easy regime still. But then at higher energies, which is unfortunately the energy where most of our neutrino oscillation experiments operate, you start producing nuclear resonances. So you need to know, first of all, about all those nuclear resonances and about the different production and decay cross sections for those resonances. That's highly non-trivial. Then at even higher energies, things get relatively simple. Again, that's the regime of deep inelastic scattering, where the neutrino sees not the nucleons, but it sees the individual quarks inside the nucleon. And that process can be described using parton distribution functions for which we have rather good data uh, thanks to experiments like HERA and the LHC experiments. So that's relatively easy again. But unfortunately, in a typical neutrino oscillation experiment operating at order GeV energies, all three processes contribute. Well, and then here in between the quasi-elastic and resonance regime in all of that region, these uh, multinucleon processes also play a role. But 2P2H is, is the buzzword here that stands for two particle, two hole interactions but because it's an interaction on two nucleons simultaneously in a sense. And again, there's a lot of uncertainty about those. Okay, let me skip this. Yes, please. Um, so why is it that we, so is it hard to operate, to construct or design experiments that work in the energy regime where, where only the quasi Elastic scattering, for example, or at very <clears throat> high energies where only the... That's, um, an, that's a, an excellent question. Thank you yeah. for that. So the reason <clears throat> you don't want to go to lower energies is because the cross sections become so small then. In particular, if you're below 100 MeV, you can't make muons anymore. And you need to make muons because muons are like a, a very, very clean signal. So you definitely want to be above the muon threshold. Um, and going to higher energies means that the oscillation length becomes very, very large. And our planet only has a, a finite size. So we are, limited by, we are limited by that. And moreover, if you make the oscillation length longer, you need to put your detector further away. So your flux drops as one over the distance squared. And so it turns out that for those reasons, the sweet spot is really at order GV energies, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you try to live with the, the uncertainties as best you can. Thanks. So let me, yeah. 
and I'm, I'm just wondering why we don't use hydrogen anymore to avoid many of these nuclear effects. Uh, Sorry? Why don't we use hydrogen anymore, like in bubble chamber uh, experiments? Um, many of the nuclear effects. I think that's mostly practical reasons, safety reasons. So the problem is that hydrogen is highly explosive and you don't want to operate a highly explosive gas in an underground cavern. I think that's really the main reason. It's actually a random nuclear experiment where you want to make a bubble chamber for the near the decker. Uh -huh. uh, a hydrogen bubble chamber? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And, but, and it gets brought up in every collaboration meeting, like in the socials. Mm -hmm. But then there's always some senior academic being like, OK, but you have to pay for the damages if anything happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, then you need to do it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sufficiently remote place that the only thing that gets damaged is your detector. <laughs> I guess it, it wouldn't even be necessary to operate like a full scale oscillation experiment with hydrogen. It would already be extremely useful um, to operate a small experiment whose task is just to measure neutrino nucleon cross sections with hydrogen. But still, it's still a neutrino experiment, so you still need a, a, a sizable target. Um, and I think that's why it, why it never happened. So what people are trying to do instead is um, they try to do measurements in the same beam on the one hand with uh, some carbohydrates, like some liquid scintillator or so, and on pure carbon. So in the carbohydrate, you measure like the, the convolution of the cross-section on carbon and the one on hydrogen. And in the pure carbon target, you measure the cross-section on carbon alone, and then you subtract it to get the cross-section on hydrogen. Of course, that's, yeah, it's of course, it sounds much easier than it is, this subtraction, because that introduces extra uncertainties. <clears throat> so let me, um, yeah, let me still show you this plot here. So what this shows is a comparison of the prediction for this particular background from different neutrino event generators. Um, just so this, this gives you an idea for, for how different the predictions from the different generators here uh, are. You see it's, uh, it is a sizable difference, tens of percent. It's not large enough to explain the anomaly though, the, the mini boon anomaly. Okay, since I have only two or three minutes left, let me see what I'm still going to show you. Um, yeah, let me show you uh, the plots that illustrate to what extent the oscillation explanation of this anomaly works or doesn't work. So the thing is, so Miniboon and LSND have been looking for electron neutrino appearance in a muon neutrino beam. If you want to explain that by invoking a sterile neutrino, that sterile neutrino necessarily has to mix with both electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos. And that means it can also lead to muon neutrino disappearance and electron neutrino disappearance. And if you go to a certain limit, which I do here just for simplicity, um, namely if you go to the limit where the baseline is long enough that the oscillations driven by the sterile neutrino are already in the averaging regime, whereas the oscillations driven by the standard oscillations don't have time to develop yet, then the oscillation probabilities take a very, very simple form. That's a based on the, the general oscillation formula one, one can show this. So namely, the electron disappearance probability depends only on UE4, so the mixing of the sterile neutrino with the electron neutrino. Similarly, muon neutrino disappearance depends only on the mixing between a muon neutrino and the sterile neutrino. Well, and the mu to E conversion probability depends on the product of the two. So, and that means uh, we have like three observables for two parameters, so the model can be over-constrained. So here is what it, what it looks like if we look only at muon neutrino to electron neutrino conversion. The horizontal axis is again the effective mixing angle, the vertical axis is the delta m square. There are the LSND and mini boon closed contours, and there is a number of exclusion limits from elsewhere, but they all uh, still leave a sizable preferred region here. So in this oscillation channel alone, everything seems consistent. The same is true if you look at electron neutrino disappearance. But now if you include muon neutrino disappearance, then this is again similar to the plot that we looked at before. So this is the mixing between the sterile neutrino and the muon neutrino versus delta m square. The 
exclu the exclusion contours here on the left are the same as what I showed in the beginning of this, uh, of, of this lecture. Um, but what's added now are those red regions. This is where the oscillation anomalies would put you. And as you can see, this is in stark conflict with this black curve here. So everything to the, to the left of the black curve is allowed from the muon disappearance experiments, but the anomalies would like you to be somewhere up here. And this is why the oscillation explanation of mini boon and LSND doesn't really work. Okay, and I think that's a good point to stop. Thank you, Johan. Um, are there some questions left? Maybe a very short question. Mm -hmm. Do you know why Microboon had a baseline 10 times longer than LSMD if it was supposed to measure the same thing? It also had an energy 10 times higher. Ah, okay. okay. So the, 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 main, the main idea was um, do the experiment as different as possible from LSMD so that there are no correlated systematic uncertainties, but aim for the same oscillation uh, peak. Other questions? What was the goal of the renal second detector of Minibun and how would that have helped in this uh, Measure the unoscillated flux. Okay. So the, 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 problem, the, the problem is um, with these large backgrounds, you can never be sure if you predicted the backgrounds correctly. But if you had two detectors, then if there was a true oscillation effect, you would see the access in say in the far detector, but not in the near detector. Whereas if there's just a misunderstanding of a background, you would see the axis in both detectors. And what's happening now, um, so Fermilab is now constructing uh, two new detectors. So Microboon has already been running for, for many years and now there's going to be the SBND and Icarus detectors. In the same beam, SBND is much closer to the target station. Icarus is much further away from the target station. So very soon we will have data in effectively a four detector configuration. So can you comment on the uh, like new uh, Burgetry or Diabe or Minos experiment, which actually allowed the uh, Sorel neutrino mixing phase space, which was not included in the LSND or Minibun experiments? Sorry, say that again. So the uh, phase space, neutro, Sorel neutrino mixing phase space, which was allowed for in the case of new constraints given by the Diabe and uh, Min Minos or Burgetry. So Minos, Minos is included here. Minos is the blue curve here. Mm -hmm. And Daya Bay, Daya Bay is not so sensitive to that sterile neutrino parameter region. What Daya Bay did is, I mean, Daya Bay, of course, confirmed at the time the reactor anomaly, but they wouldn't see anything beyond that, I think. Well, they, they, do now that the reactor anomaly is gone, they do provide an exclusion limit. Um, and what that exclusion limit does is, I think it's not included in this plot yet. Um, it would probably tend to push you to somewhat uh, even further to the right here, because it means that UE4 needs to be larger, which means, no, no UE4 needs to be smaller, which means UE4 would need to be even larger to explain the mini boon and LSMD anomalies. So you're saying they are not sensitive enough? No, they, they, could have, they could have seen something, but the problem is what you know from LSMD and mini boon, if you interpret it as, as oscillations, is only the product of UE4 and UE4. So you can now invoke Diabay, for instance, to constrain UE4, and then this tells you where your UE4 needs to be. And it tells you that it needs to be well far to the right of these limits here. So if there had been sizable Nui disappearance, yeah, then Diabe might have seen it. Uh, what about the Barge tree? Uh, hmm? The Barge tree, I don't know how you say it. <laughs> In these slides you have mentioned before about the Barge tree experiment also. You have mentioned the limits. In in the in, in the reactor slides, yes. I mean, three. With the anomalies, yes. But that is, that is that is an older ex that is an older experiment. I mean, they in a, in a sense you can throw all the reactor experiments together in, in in one group. They all they all measure the same thing and they are all consistent amongst each other. Um, and yeah, the, the main problem with them is they don't see an anomaly anymore. 
So that means that the mixing of the sterile neutrino with electron neutrinos now needs to be small. Um, and that requires the mixing with muon neutrinos to be even larger if you want to explain the mini and LSD anomaly, which increases the tension. Moreover, I'm not, not sure if you've heard about the gallium anomaly, which was also recently reconfirmed by the best experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and that is now basically, if you're, this is now inconsistent with the reactor experiment. So in the electron disappearance channel, there's now tension between different experiments looking at this for the same thing. So it's a big mess. <laughs> okay, that's <clears throat> one last question. And then we also have a coffee break. Yeah. So I imagine these baselines are too short for this to be explaining any kind of non-standard interaction with the matter, right? So do we have any candidates left or are we just kind of raising our hands? In the so there, there, are, there are a number of proposals to explain, uh, to explain uh, specifically the mini Boon anomaly. I think that there is no proposal that explains all the anomalies that are there. There are a lot of ideas for explaining the mini Boon anomaly I have here. Uh, so in, in the slide deck, there will be two slides that give some references and, and list the possibilities. But the, 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 the leading version of these is uh, typically involving something a little bit heavier, like a sterile neutrino of maybe order MeV or so, that is produced and then decays. Yeah. And it can either decay to actual electron neutrinos to actually enhance the electron neutrino component in the beam, or it can decay, um, for instance, to photons, again, mimicking the signal in Miniboon. But again, this works only for Miniboon. This does not uh, explain any of the other anomalies. Thank you. Especially doesn't explain LSD. Okay, uh, I think we can have follow-up questions. Uh, you're also here. I'm still, I'm still here uh, during the day, yeah. Okay, so let's thank you again for today.